Well, open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, please. I thank the Lord for the message. I pray that he'd give me utterance. <clears throat> Concern about Ian, prayer for Ian this week. Um, mine's really thinking about eyes on Christ. I've taught many years here, five years now, I think, that eyes on Christ, you can endure anything in this life, even torture. If you lose a parent that doesn't know God savingly, that's torture. That's the time for your eyes to be on Christ. <clears throat> and by the way, turn back in your hymnal to 457. I want to show you what the chains of bondage sound like falling off of you. Uh, blew me away when we sang this tonight. When your eyes are on Christ and the Holy Spirit resides within you, what will come out of your mouth is the fourth stanza, 457. If for thy sake upon my name shall reproach shall be, all hell reproach and welcome shame. This is the sound of the bondage of Satan falling off of you. When that comes out of your mouth, your eyes are affixed on Christ as righteousness, pure righteousness, and yourself is all evil. This is what it is when you're freed from what deceived you all those years in the short lifetime that we have. To think of yourself as evil and Christ as righteous and to say, if he didn't die for me, if his blood wasn't shed for me, honor to his blood is more important than my eternal well-being. Then cast me into hell, O oh Father. Cast me into hell because that's honorable to his blood if he didn't shed it for me. I'm not going to heaven without his blood over me. That's ridiculous. These, this is the chain of bondage dropping from your body. If you ever hear this out of your mouth, that's freedom. That's liberty. And I want everybody here to see Christ and the Father are one. That's the title of the message this evening. <coughs> I and my Father are one. And you think, well, the Holy Spirit isn't in that. Yes, it, yes, it is. If you see Christ is righteous. You see the Father and it's the Holy Spirit within you that gives you the eyeballs to see this. They're all three in the title. I and my Father are one. If you get it, the Holy Spirit resides within you. If you see Christ. Colossians 1 verse 9 reads, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all, unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, <clears throat> strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Wow, what an inheritance. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We're talking about Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. When you see Christ, you'll see him as the firstborn, the beloved of the Father, the number one. This message tonight is about Christ. His names are so dynamic and intense in the scripture. Advocate, Adam, Almighty. His name's actually Amen in the scripture. Apostle, he's the apostle. The author and finisher of faith, the author of eternal salvation, the arm of the Lord, the beloved son. I'm only to the bees, so this is probably gonna be a couple Wednesday night messages. <laughs> Look at all these names for the Lord Jesus Christ. These names help define his character and conduct throughout the scripture. It helps give his saints sight on Christ during times of trouble, during times of anguish, during times of sorrow, during times of torment. <clears throat> now, I read out of Colossians 1, and you think, well, I only read about the Father, which is in verse 12. I only read about the Son, which is verse 14, his blood. But I read about the Holy Spirit in verse 9. Look back in 1 Colossians chapter 9, verse 9. Filled with the knowledge, second half of the verse says, filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Spiritual understanding. 
It's the knowledge of God. The spiritual understanding, spiritual wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to consider yourself evil and Christ righteous. This is the secret. This is the key to eternal salvation. To grasp that you're evil and Christ is righteous, that, that he is all and you are nothing, is salvation. When God sent Moses to relieve the children of their bondage in Egypt, he told them, you go and you tell them, I'm going to send them out. I'm going to relieve them of this bondage. And Moses says, who do I say sent me? Give me a name. I've got to have a name. i got to know more about you. i got to have a character and conduct. i got to say it in detail. And, and, and God the Father says, is, by way of introduction, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you, is what God Almighty told Moses when he went back to release the children of Israel out of bondage. When you're relieved out of bondage, you see the I am. And that word that, I translate that, and that's a tough one to translate. It's a pretty dynamic word. The best I could do is it means the, the, one, the one and only. I am the one and only I am. This is the Father, this is the Son, and this is the Holy Spirit. The three in one are the one and only I am's. <clears throat> and John, I've got another passage by way of introduction. John 14, 7, you can see at the top of your outline. If ye, if ye had known me, Christ writes, ye would have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. This is the Holy Spirit, to know God and to see God. To know Christ and to see Christ. This is the Holy Spirit. This is the very eyeballs that you are given when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, takes residency up inside of you, and gives you to see Christ as righteousness. And no one else even comes close to righteousness. R isn't even in their definition. There's no righteous except for one, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, Adam is another name that, that he gives the Lord Jesus Christ. Point number one in your outline. First Corinthians, he says, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. That's Adam that we fell in. The very first man created. When he fell, we fell guilty of that original sin. And we, sentence of eternal torment was put upon each one of us. But that's not the end of the story. The last Adam, a quickening spirit. The last Adam is the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And that quickening spirit, the word quickening means to make alive and to give life. This is the Virgin Mary that was visited by the quickening spirit that gives life. And his seed with that Virgin Mary equals pure blood. The pure blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is the quickening spirit. He's the Adam. He's the Adam. He's the advocate also. Turn to 1 John chapter 1. Now you say, why would I need an advocate? An advocate is somebody that represents you. Well, if you have perfect righteousness, you don't need an advocate. But you got to have it perfectly. You can't fail ever in one thought or deed your whole life long. You don't have it. You need an advocate. Christ is the advocate. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is godly confession. Confession is not listing your sins. Confession is per this verse. If we confess our sins, that, that, that that's all we are is sin. If, I, if what comes out of our mouths, you know, my Father, I am sin. That's salvation. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write unto you, I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with him. So who, who has an advocate? Those that understand that I was I was born in self-righteousness. That's my problem. The very best part of my being before salvation was that I, I'm self-righteous and I'm good before God. God better save me. 
This is what we were born. This is the fall of Adam. This is demanding God to be, to be led by us. This self-righteous person, this self-righteous existence, this self-righteous mindset is the very core of sin. Now that I see that that's evil, he said, if any man sin, yeah, that's, that's 100% me. I'm evil to the core of my being. Every bit of my being's evil. You have an advocate. These are the ones that have the advocate. The ones that are fully poor, fully condemned in themselves. The ones that self-deny any, any righteousness. These are the ones that have an advocate with the Father. And His name, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You see, when you see that He's righteous, the righteous, you see that your sin. This is salvation. This is the advocate. The advocate came and lived and died for a particular people. And these are the ones that come to know this. And we come to know that he's almighty. Revelation 1.8 is in your outline. I am Alpha and Omega. That's simply the alphabet. God boils it down so everybody can understand. God says, I am. I am. Alpha to Omega. A to Z in, in English language. Omega is the last letter of the Greek, Greek alphabet. Z is the English. From a, I'm from A to Z is what God says. There's nobody that came before me. There's nobody after me. I declared everything. I spoke everything into existence. I gave everybody their path in their life. Everybody, every breath and every heartbeat, every second of every day of every person's life. And at the end, I'm wrapping it all up. I'll come the second time and destroy all those that I didn't die for <clears throat> right in front of everybody. And I'm going to go right up into heaven with my Father with all of those that I shed my righteous blood for. This is the one that's the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come. The Almighty. This is the Almighty God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's also, I've, I've never seen this before this day time, called Amen. Revelation 3, I'm going to say amen in a whole different light from now on. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. I've always thought amen was the end of a statement. Amen's a noun. Christ. Revelations chapter 3 and verse 14. And unto the angel of the church, of this church, write, These things saith the amen. The Amen writes this to the church. The faithful and true witness. That's got to be Christ. The beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. These are those that Christ didn't die for. I think they're okay based on them being religious enough to make it to heaven. But I'm not interested in sitting down in the gospel ministry and waiting on the Lord. I'll do it my way. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now he's talking about man's self-righteousness. Your, your best state on this earth, your, the, the brightest moment of being the most ethical person, helping others and doing the right thing, he calls wretched, miserable, Poor, blind, and naked. Some of us find this out in our lifetime. Others die self-righteous and perish eternally. I, <clears throat> I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that thou shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And note thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. That's the new heart. That's the Holy Spirit residing within you and changing from worshiping yourself as God to Christ is my God. Christ is righteous. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. That's, that's resting on the blood of Christ. You sit on the throne of God Almighty. 
You're resting on the work of Christ, the blood of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Spirit says it. The Spirit gives you your eyeball to see and to rest on Christ and to, to repent and to turn from thinking your self-righteous works buys you merit before God. It can't buy you a thing. God will not receive man's works for salvation. He receives only the blood of his dear son. Stop trying to be religious to save yourself and rely on, on Mr. Amen. Amen means it's finished. I agree. Christ is alone righteous. Amen is who we rest on and in. Amen. And he's the apostle. This next name of Christ's apostle and the author and finisher of faith, they're coupled together strongly. Apostle is a Greek word, apostolos, and it says he that is sent. Oh, and the father sent his son. His, the father loved us so much that he predetermined that his son would buy us back with his pure blood. And, and the, the path in which Christ went when he was sent was he became a man. God himself became a man, stooped to the level of our day-to-day -day existence. Born, cradled, cared for until older, and then preaching his righteousness, saving his people, putting his spirit within us, dying on that cross, shedding his holy blood, going into that tomb for three days, and then being brought right up out of it because in him is, is only righteousness, only holiness, only goodness. After he paid for our sins on the cross, there's no shame for us or Christ. The penalty of sin and death has been paid with his blood and we're free. <clears throat> He's the author and finisher of our faith because he conducted faith on the cross. It says in Hebrews 12 too, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame of it, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He's resting on his substitutionary work in our place, not your work, in his work alone, exclusively. And he's the author of eternal salvation. He wrote it all. Being made perfect, it says in Hebrews 5, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. How do you obey him? Go out and live a good life? No, you obey him by saying you're 100% sin and he's 100% righteous. These are the obedience these are the ones that are obedient. These are the ones that yield to Christ as alone righteousness. And it's the arm of the Lord that does it to you. Turn to Isaiah 53. Another name for Christ is the arm of the Lord. Isaiah 53. Verse 1, who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The arm, the arm of the Lord is revealed to some people. The mighty arm of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his work of righteousness which saves us. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a, a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected of men. That's all men, especially the believers. After salvation, we revealed this to us. And acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. We didn't even consider him. He ought to die. That's what our mind was before salvation. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for, wait a minute, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. This is the time you just start bawling. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. What was our peace? Hell and destruction, the torment and rage of God the Father's wrath upon us. That was put on Christ instead of us. With his stripes, with his substitutionary suffering, which is called stripes, we're healed. We don't have to go through one sliver, not one millisecond 
milliseconds, point zero zero one seconds. We don't even get that much wrath. Not one millisecond is going to be on us. The stripes were on Christ and were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned everyone to his own way. That's self-righteousness. And the Lord had laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. The iniquity is a false covering, supposed good works to justify us. And the wrath that God has for that is, is extreme. It's extreme. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. He didn't even open his mouth. He didn't complain about it. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth, not complain one bit, yielding and obedient to God the Father and taking that treacherous death in our place. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of a particular people. God the Father's people was he stricken. That ought to grieve you. That ought to make you bawl if you really think and know that Christ was beaten in your place. That the wrath of God the Father was upon his back. He did nothing wrong. He's holy righteousness. He is the only holy righteous one. Yet he died for those of us that just hate him, abhor him, look the other way, don't care for him. What an amazing arm of the Lord to die for those that despise him. What a mighty arm. As we despised, he snatched us back and loved us anyway. Mm. The beloved son is another name for Christ. In Matthew 12, 18, your outline, it says, My beloved servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased, I will pour my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Let's see what the judgment to the Gentiles is. Isaiah 10. We're in Isaiah, just back a few more chapters to Isaiah 10. Isaiah 10, verse 33 is a little scary, but it's precious at the end. Behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, shall loop the bow with terror, and the high ones of stature shall he hewn down, and the haughty shall he humble. Boy, there's hope for those that are haughty if the Lord get a hold of you. The Lord get a hold of the haughty, his right arm, and he'll show you judgment. And he shall cut down the thickets of the forest with iron. Iron rod slices through wood like nothing. You ever cut a board with a circular saw? It goes through it like knife through a butter. Knife, just like that. This is the power of God Almighty against men. He'll either cut you in eternal torment or he'll cut you while you're in this lifetime with a new spirit within you. And you'll see how destitute and desperate you were finally. Chapter 11, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon Christ, the Spirit of the wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. He's going to put it right inside you. And shall make him of a quick understanding and the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of the eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of the ears, but with righteousness shall he judge. Only the poor. Those of us that find out we're poor, find out we're judged with the blood of Christ. All the judgment of God the Father has been placed on Christ in our place, and we're righteous. His righteousness has charged us. The poor find out that we're made whole in Christ. Turn, <clears throat> turn for an example, please, in Matthew 8 for the use of the message. I want to show you a man in his lifetime that was a mighty man in his career and occupation, but spiritually, he is a poor, evil person, and he knew it. He knew it to the core of his being. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, and Jesus entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. This is a pretty important person in the military, a leader, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I'm going to come and heal him. That man said, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. You're righteous. I'm evil. He says, Lord, I'm not worthy 
You don't come to my house. Please don't come under my roof. It's all evil. Everything you look at, every bit of my stuff, everything that I am, it's evil. But you just speak and it's going to be it's going to be fine. My servant will be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, you go and go with another. You come, you come with and my servant. Do this and he better do it. Of course they're going to do it. And Jesus marveled and said, wow, I have not found so great a faith. No, not in Israel. Was it the authority that this man communicated that Christ had? It was the humility. It was to say, you don't come to my house. It's all evil. There's not a thing right about me. But you, you've got all the authority and you're holy God. You can speak life into people because you've spoken it into me. The very fact that I see that I'm evil, I know I'm righteous in your righteousness. And that's what Christ expands on verse 11. I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Who are the folks that sit down in heaven? They're sitting and resting on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In their lifetime, like the centurion leader, he said, I'm resting on your righteousness, your authority, your goodness, not mine. I'm evil. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into our outer darkness. These are somebody. They die, die out of this life thinking they're good. Thinking that God better receive them. They're of their own kingdom. They've created a little kingdom of their own opinion. And God better receive me. These, he says, they're going to go into weeping and gnashing of teeth. It'll never end. Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way. And as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. Servant was healed at selfsame hour. Of course he was. Couldn't have been any other way. The Holy Spirit was inside the centurion saying, Christ, you're altogether lovely and I'm 100% evil. This is salvation. This is the use of, of the title, I and my Father are one. If you ever see the Lord Jesus Christ, if you ever see the Father and that they're one, it's because the eyes of the Holy Spirit are within you seeing them. I bless the Lord for the message.